Um, I, I have the awesome privilege of, of helping us to look at the Word of God and to hear what God has got to say to us today. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. So um, if you have a Bible with you, it's Matthew chapter 4. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you or some kind of device, can I just please encourage you, um, come to church meetings with a Bible or with a, uh, a Bible reading app, um, because it's great to read along together um, in the Word of God as, as we look at it together. So Matthew chapter 4, and from verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of of God. So just before we really kind of get into this, I thought it would probably be worth reminding you um, when this um, meeting finishes, it would be probably a great idea if you um, at some point this afternoon have something to eat. Um, and, and actually, a um, bit of advice, probably tomorrow um, you ought to eat um, as well. And um, Actually, we'll try and remind you next Sunday, but could you try and remember yourselves every day between now and next Sunday? Because we, you know, we're obviously not necessarily going to be there to remind you every day. You probably need to eat every day. I don't know if you're aware of that. Some people are shaking their heads. Honestly, you do. <laughs> you do need to eat every day. I mean, it, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? What are you on about? Who is this mad guy at the front telling us that we need to eat every day? You know that you need to eat. And I know occasionally some of us kind of get so busy chasing our tail throughout the day that we suddenly realize we've forgotten to eat lunch or something like that, or we've skipped breakfast. You should never do that. It's the most important meal of the day. Has nobody ever told you? Don't skip breakfast. Um, but, you know... It is. But actually, we, we don't normally, I mean, even if we you get that busy and we forget to eat, and you know, at some point our body reminds us, doesn't it? And it starts complaining, and, um, and most of us don't need reminding um, to eat, because we know that if we don't eat, eventually we will die. When Jesus was hungry in the world, I love that, because it's, it's kind of like one of the biggest understatements ever because it says that Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days. Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days and it says, and Jesus was hungry. It's kind of a bit of an understatement, isn't it? Um, and the devil comes to him in that moment and you see something more than just some kind of ceremonial, you know, um, going without food. It, it, it's not just about some religious practice here. Something's going on between Jesus and his father. Something much bigger is at stake. But, but the devil uses this, this fact that Jesus is hungry. Um, and he attempts to distract Jesus from his relationship with his father. And he and attempts to derail Jesus being obedient to his father and fulfilling the plan and purpose of his father. And, and so he comes to him and he tries to, he goes for his physical need that I would imagine at this point he's feeling quite acutely. He's not eaten for 40 days and the, the devil comes to him and he, and he tries to tempt him. And Jesus responds to the devil in quoting um, a verse of scripture that's actually from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 in the Old Testament. And Jesus says this, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man can't live. Human beings, men and women, cannot live just on bread. In other words, food, water, and oxygen in themselves, they might keep us physically alive. You and I know, don't we? We need to eat, we need to drink, and we need air to breathe, and we can physically go on living. But actually, Jesus says, to really be alive, you need something more than that. To really be alive, you have to live by the word 
That is proceeding. It literally, when it says every word that comes from the mouth of God, literally it's proceeding. It's continuously coming forth from the mouth of God. What God is saying, what God is speaking. God's word to us sustains us. It keeps us alive. Genuinely alive. God's word to us directs us. God's word to us energizes and empowers us. Enables us to be who he has called us to be. It transforms us. God's word to us is light and it is life. God's word is more than the Bible. We, we often use that term, the word of God, when we're talking about the Bible. I even um, said it to morning, this morning. I said, oh, I'm here to open up the word to us. And, um, and we often use that terminology. But you know what? God's word is more than the Bible. The Bible is an amazing written record of what God has spoken and continues to speak into our lives. But God's word is more than the Bible. Because Jesus himself is described as the word of God. He is God's utterance. He is God's speech. And do you know what? Jesus is the best speech ever made. Jesus is, if I can put it like this, God at his most eloquent. I mean, God's always eloquent. But God at his most inspiring. Of course, God's always inspiring. But Jesus is the pinnacle of all that God has ever said. Jesus is the best speech ever. He is God's speech to mankind. Jesus, the word of God. In John 1, 1 to 5, it says this, John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning through him, All things were made. If you've read the account of creation, we understand that whatever our understanding or interpretation of of the science and the, the exact things that took place, we understand that whatever took place, took place because God spoke. That's the whole point, that God spoke. His word came forth. But now we understand that that was Jesus. Well, actually, we don't quite understand But we're told and we believe that in the beginning was Jesus the word. And through him, everything was created. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Without the word of God, without the speech of God, that is Jesus. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Because Jesus, the word, is light and life. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times. And in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory. My goodness, why are we not excited? (laughs) Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Has anybody given their life to Jesus? Is there any Christians in this room? Jesus! You know, that person that you've given your whole life to, he is the radiance of God's glory. And he made the universe. 
And, well, I better carry on reading. <laughs> the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Right, so, you know, if you drive a car and you fill up your car, you go to the petrol station and you've got the ordinary petrol and you've got the super-duper petrol that's got stuff added to it. And just occasionally, someone comes up to you when you're about to select the ordinary petrol and says, do you know that if you put this super-duper extra special petrol in, it's got all this amazing stuff in it, and actually it can do your car so much good and you can go so many more miles and it's, it's just so much better because it'll just like sustain and, and, and energize and, and you know, it's just a better fuel, Right? The word of God sustains the universe. The word of God, the fuel, because man will not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So for your physical needs, you put food in for energy. Your body burns the food and does what it does. Yeah, I better... You know, my son's got GCSE science coming up this week. I think I might need to brush up and so I'm not going to be much help, am I? But your, your body does some stuff and, and, and you burn the energy or you create the energy, whatever happens. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> but it's like fuel, isn't it? It's like fuel to your body. The fuel that you're supposed to put in spiritually if you want to be spiritually alive, because meeting your physical needs isn't enough, this isn't like the super-duper kind of like a little bit extra, a few pence more petrol at the petrol station. This is universe-sustaining fuel. This is universe-creating and universe-sustaining. This is the power that's in that word. It can speak planets into existence and keep them in motion. It can make mountains and rivers and streams and valleys and, and, and all kinds of incredible features of creation. And galaxies and... Oh, I so wish I was better at science. <laughs> but all this stuff, this amazing stuff. And it's just like incredible. And the Word of God did that. And you exist because God spoke you into being. I knew for it was because your dad got excited and <laughs> we'll stop there. <laughs> but actually, God, your dad probably did get excited, but your God spoke <laughs> you into being. Yes. 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 That's right. He speaks things into being. That word is so powerful. Do you know what? The fact that God speaks to us is amazing. The fact that God who speaks and a world comes into existence, and not just one world, but thousands and millions, and I don't know how many billions of stars there are, and all of it God's creation. The fact that the same God who speaks that, and the pinnacle of whose speech is Jesus Christ, the radiance of God's glory... The fact that he speaks to you and he speaks to me, that he doesn't deem himself to be too busy or too important, that he's not like, well, I'm sorry, actually, I have to prioritize my time, so I'm only going to speak to the top most influential 100, you know, Christian superstars in the planet, and I'll just trust them to talk to the rest of you. But he speaks to you. And he speaks to me. And he says the same word, the same speech, the same continual speaking that sustains a universe will sustain you in your life. And God is speaking all the time. He never stops speaking. 
Because it's continually, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that continues to pour forth from the mouth of God. Speech that is constantly and consistently coming forth. You see, sometimes we pray, don't we? And we say, oh God, I pray that you would speak clearly. The thing is, God never mumbles. He doesn't struggle to get his words out. We struggle to hear. And we pray, I, you know, I know what we mean when we pray it. You know, it's, that's what we mean though, isn't it? We mean, God, help me to hear. If there's a problem, it's with my hearing, it's not with his speaking. He's speaking all the time. And the question is, will I stop and listen? Psalm 119 Verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. His word is light to me. I can't see what I'm supposed to see without his word. And what I see without his word to me is darkness. It's his word that brings light and illumination and helps me to understand the reality of what's going on around me. Philippians 2, 14 to 16 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. You see, his word is light and his word is life. It's real life. It's not the mundane, mediocre, run-of-the-mill kind of life that we get deceived by because the media, what we read and what we watch and what we listen to is constantly lying to us and telling us what normal, ordinary, everyday life is. But God's word to us says something different. God speaks to us and presents himself to us in Jesus and says it's all about something entirely different. You see, the truth is this. And I share this in case there are any amongst us this morning that have never heard this message before. That God made you and loved you right from the very beginning. And he made you for a relationship with himself where he would be for you the perfect father. Where he would never abandon you, never leave you, never forsake you. Where he would give himself unreservedly in relationship to you. And more than that, where he would draw you into his plan and his purpose and say, let's do this together. Let's transform a world together. Let's make a world perfect the way it always should have been. It calls us to be part of what he's doing in his world. But right from the beginning, human beings have consistently rejected God and said, we'll do things our own way. We'll live outside of a relationship with you. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God. But maybe, just maybe, you start to hear God speaking to you. Something stirring inside. Some kind of, some kind of nagging thought, some kind of growing feeling that maybe God is real. Maybe there's someone who does love me. Maybe there's someone who did create me. Do you know what? More than that, because of this separation, because of this this rejection of him, because there is no relationship between you and him, he sent Jesus to die for you. He sent Jesus, the Son of God, his ultimate speech to us to say, I love you and I want you back in relationship and I want you back for the purpose that I made you for. And Jesus died to pay the price for our rejection of relationship with God. So that we could come back into that relationship and be restored as sons and daughters. So that we could know him as this perfect father. And so that we could be part again of his plan and his purpose. And if you're here today and you've never done that before, even now in this moment, you can say, God, I am sorry for living my life apart from you. 
You can say, I believe that you sent Jesus and that he died on a cross to pay the price for my rejection of relationship with you. You can say, Lord, please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died and I believe that he rose again so that I can have a new life with you. And you can say, I commit my life to following you and to living for you for the rest of my days. And in that moment, the Bible says you begin a brand new life. And do you know what? Most of us here this morning have made that decision. And we made that decision, why? Because we heard God's word. Because God spoke life into us. Because God spoke. And in his graciousness, he enabled us to hear him. And we responded. And his word brought us to life. I just want to go back to what Jesus said. When he quoted that verse from Deuteronomy. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, that verse has a context. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's towards the start of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 8, and I'm just going to read from verse 1 so that we can understand the context of this verse that Jesus quoted. It says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna. You see, God led his people into the wilderness where there was no natural supply of food. And he spoke to them, and he said to them, I will provide for you. And then they had to believe what he said to them. And they had to be obedient to him, and trust him, and live by his word to them. There was no natural supply of food. And so they had to put their trust in what he had said. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Swell, not smell. Know then... In your heart, that as a man disciples his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land with brooks, streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. And so it goes on. You see, the context of the verse that Jesus spoke in that moment was one of obedience. It wasn't just hearing the word. It wasn't just kind of theoretical knowledge of what God is saying. But it was living by what God is saying. Doing what God is saying. Hearing what God is saying. Believing what God is saying. And putting it into practice in my life. Obedience to God's word is what will sustain you. Building your life on the word of God is what will sustain you. Hearing God's word in and of itself is not enough. We have to hear it. We have to believe it. We have to do it. We have to hear it. We have to believe it. We have to do it. James said in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus um, spoke about wise and foolish builders. A wise builder who um, is like someone who hears God's word and puts it into practice. It's like a wise builder who built his house upon the rock. 
And when the storm and the floods came and it was shaken and tested, that house did not fall because it was built on a solid foundation. That's what it's like when you live in obedience to what God is constantly speaking to you. But the foolish builder, he built his house upon the sand. And that's like when someone hears the word of God and they do not put it into practice. And when the storm comes, that house that's built on the sand, well, the sand is just shifting. The sand will give way and the house will fall. There is no foundation. That's what it's like when we hear God's word, but don't put it into practice. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, those famous words of the Great Commission, Jesus says, go and make disciples of every nation, teaching them what? To obey everything I have commanded you. To obey everything that I have commanded you. In John 15, 9 to 11, in the midst of that amazing passage in John 15 about a vine and its branches and, and how we're called into this wonderful, intimate relationship with God where we remain in Him or abide in Him, where we dwell permanently in relationship with Him. And in John 15, verse 9, Jesus says, I have loved you with the same love with which the Father has loved me. Isn't that incredible? John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Amazing. The same love shared between the Father and the Son. That's the love that Jesus has for you. And that love will never ever fail. However many times that you mess up, that you get things wrong, however faithless you are, he will always remain faithful. He will always keep on loving you. He will never, ever stop loving you. And then he says, now remain in my love. Wait a minute, I thought you said that, that his love would, would never fail. And, and No, his love will never, ever fail. His love, will, he will keep pouring out his love. But you have a decision you have a decision. Will I live in that place? Will I live just in that place of abiding in, remaining in, dwelling permanently in that love? Will I live from that place? And what does Jesus say? He says, now remain in my love if you keep my commands. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. It's not that if you don't keep his commands, he's going to tire of you, get fed up with you. I've tried and tried and tried with you, and now I'm going to move on to someone else. No. He will never, ever stop loving you. But he says to you, live there. Abide there. Remain there. Live from that place. Because that's what real life is. And to live there and remain there and dwell in that place, you need to live in obedience to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So do you see how important it is to be hearing what God is saying? To hear him speaking. To listen to his voice. So that, you know, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. So that we can know his voice, so that we can hear his voice, so that we can believe it and so that we can do it. Now, of course, God speaks to us in so many ways, doesn't he? He speaks to us through creation. You know, the Bible says that even, even people that don't know God are without excuse because creation itself is, a, is enough of a, a declaration of God's goodness. So he, he even speaks to us through the created world around us. He speaks to us through our circumstances. Has anyone ever had that, that kind of feeling like too many things have just come to, kind of come together in all this weird kind of way that God must be saying something to me here? He speaks to us through, through Christian brothers and sisters. I mean, sometimes they kind of, they have a sense that God is saying something through them because they come and they encourage us, they share something they've read, they share something they believe God has said to them and, and, and it's obvious. But other times, it, it's like they don't even know that, that what they're saying to us is actually God's word to us in that moment. You ever had that? Someone comes and they share something with you and suddenly you think, ah, oh, that's what God is saying to me. He speaks to us through visions and, and dreams and, and prophetic words. 
I mean, not every dream that we have comes from God, necessarily. I mean, I thought this wasn't from God because I dreamt the other night that I went bald. And, uh, but actually, I shared this in the first meeting and someone has since shared with me the meaning of this dream. And so I don't know, maybe it was God after all. Um, but maybe not physically yet, Lord. Um, <laughs> I mean, some people even hear the audible voice of God, but um, it's probably not that many people, so don't get hung up on that. I have never heard the audible voice of God, and God speaks to me all the time. But I've had to learn, because the main way that God speaks to me, other than through the Bible, is, is, is through speaking in, in my kind of inner being. And I've had to learn to distinguish what's me and my imagination, or me and my desire, and what I would really like God to be saying, And what's what he is actually saying to me? And that comes through practice and checking it out with the Bible and uh, and leaders and and trusted brothers and sisters and making mistakes. But you know, there is a way that God has spoken and continues to speak to every single one of us that is readily available to every single one of us in this room. He speaks to us through the written word of his scriptures, the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God-breathed. What did Jesus say? He said that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from that comes from the mouth of God. Every scripture is God-breathed, comes from the mouth of God. Every scripture is God-breathed. Now, of course, of course, the Bible was written down by human beings. And there's even something of those human authors in what they write, because they write in different ways with different styles and, and different characteristics. So there's something of them. And yet, nevertheless, we're told that even though it was written down by humans and there's something of them in it, nevertheless, it is God's word to us. It is inspired by God himself. It is God's word proceeding from his mouth to us. Every verse of the Bible is God breathed. If we want to live in obedience to the Word of God, if we want to live real life, universe sustaining life, this incredible, exciting, exhilarating, abundant life to the full that Jesus has for us, wait for it, folks, this is incredibly profound. If we want to live that kind of life, we have. To read the Bible. I know. It's like the most incredible message I've ever brought you. We have to read the Bible. I don't mean dip in and out of your favorite verses. See, when you dip in and out of your favorite verses, like you've got that subject that you really love. And you've convinced yourself that actually all that God has got to say is about those three verses. That subject, that particular emphasis that you carry. And you listen to the preachers that preach about that subject because you think it's amazing. And why doesn't everyone understand that it's all about this thing? And so you listen to those podcasts and they recommend other people that preach on that same subject. So you listen to them too. And it's like confirming to you it's really all about this particular little subject. The thing was you stopped reading your Bible. Or you read the verses that they directed to you and you stopped reading the whole thing. Because if you carried on reading the whole thing, you would have realized that actually it was all about taking the gospel to the people all around you. If you carried on reading the Bible, everything would be in perspective. And you'd realize actually, yeah, that thing that those people are preaching about, yes, it's important. But actually, now I get it in perspective with the whole of what God is saying. I mean, if we read the whole of the Bible, we understand that certain things in the Old Testament are now fulfilled in Jesus. And so I can't just dip in and take out this verse out of context and build a whole kind of new subject and and thing around that because I have to understand that the old covenant law is fulfilled in Jesus. Now Jesus made it perfectly clear. He himself made it clear that all of the Bible is about him. 
The Old Testament is actually about Jesus. But there are parts of the Old Testament, laws and, and ceremonies and, and regulations that have been fulfilled in him that we no longer have to follow. So if you've never read the whole of the Bible, I really want to recommend you start with the New Testament. You need to understand what Jesus has done before you go back to make sense of the Old Testament. So if you've never read the whole of the Bible, and I promise you, there are pretty likely to be lots of people here that haven't. But you know what? That's not good enough for us. I'm not condemning anybody, but it's not good enough for us. We're the people of God. We're the people who have given our lives to living in obedience to God's word because that's how we are alive, by the word of God. So dipping in and out of a few verses every so often is not enough for us. We need to read and read and read and read our Bibles. Now, you might say to me, do you know what, Richard? Actually, reading is just not my thing. Yeah, but I'm not asking you to read the Bible because you like reading. I'm asking you to read the Bible because it's life to you. I mean, Smith Wigglesworth, any of you ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Yeah, he was like this um, famous um, Pentecostal preacher and he saw incredible miracles, miracle after miracle after miracle. He saw people raised from the dead. It was incredible. But you know what? He grew up illiterate as a child. He couldn't read or write. And so I would imagine that reading wasn't really his thing. And actually, he, wasn't, he couldn't actually read until after he got married. His wife taught him how to read. And she taught him how to read from the Bible. And he, it said that Smith Wigglesworth never read anything other than the Bible. But this is what he had to say about the Bible. This is someone who reading wasn't really his thing. He said, the Bible is the word of God, supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible in valor, infinite in scope, regenerative in power, infallible in authority, universal in interest, personal in application, inspired in totality. Read it through, write it down, pray it in, work it out, and then pass it on. Truly, it is the word of God. It brings into man the personality of God. It changes the man until he becomes the epistle of God. It transforms his mind, changes his character, takes him on from grace to grace and gives him an inheritance in the spirit. God comes in, dwells in, walks in, talks through and sups with him. And reading wasn't really his thing. But the word of God became life to him. This is life to us. We need to be bothered with reading the Bible. We've all had times when we've sat down and we've read a passage of scripture. And then we wondered, what on earth did God just say to me? We've probably all had times when we've read a passage of scripture and realized, actually, I don't have a clue what I just read. Have have you ever had that? You've kind of been reading and you're like, oh, I probably ought to go back and start again because I've actually been thinking about something else while I've been reading. Has anyone ever, is that just me? We've all had times like that. We want the times when we're like, Wow! God just spoke to me. But the truth is, every time, God just spoke to you. And sometimes you have to trust that and believe that. Do you know what? Sometimes you're going to read passages of scripture and in the moment, it's not going to be the wow moment. But then you're going to be reading something else, maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe months in the future. And you're going to be reading something else and suddenly you're going to go, I read about that. I read that somewhere else too. And sometimes you won't be able to find it and it'll be really frustrating. But you just keep reading and you keep reading and you read all of your life every day. I'm not talking about your lucky Bible reading for the day. Like, you know, you, you read one verse and then you read a, a page of somebody else's thoughts about that verse and it's like, great, I'm not going to get run over now because I've done my lucky Bible reading. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading as much as you can. 
not about condemnation. It's not about judging what one person reads and what another person reads. But I'm saying, come on, people. Let's push ourselves. Let's, let, let's hunger for the word of God. Let's me- read more than we've read before. Reading the Bible repeatedly, over and over and over. And, you know, I'd love it. I'd love it. Cause us, you know, let, let's cause a real problem in the church because everyone's reading their Bibles and they've all got loads of questions. Because it's going to happen. When you read the Bible, you'll be like, oh, oh, that's, oh, I didn't see that. But how does that fit with this? And let's create loads of questions. Let, let's, like, make, you know, the site leadership team have to work really, really hard because they've got to work out how we're going to get people together into groups to answer all these questions. And, you know, and, and because we're all reading the Bible. And we're all hearing God speak to us. And, and yes, sometimes we have to, like, you know, get help and, and work out how this fits with that bit. And, you know, but that's a great problem to have, isn't it? If we would read our Bibles, this church will change. You see, you can't read the Bible and think healing doesn't matter. You can't read the Bible and think, I don't need to get out and evangelize. You can't read the Bible repeatedly and fail to notice that actually it's quite important that you share your faith with the people around you. If we would read our Bibles Constantly and continuously in the presence of the Holy Spirit, saying, God, teach me, feed me. I will believe what you say to me and I will put it into practice. It will consistently remind us of our identity in Christ as sons and daughters of God and heirs of his kingdom. It will convince us that we are loved by God. It will inspire us with God's goodness. With his grace and his majesty and his power, it will call us to lay our lives down in passionate and extravagant worship of him. Because it will make us lovers of God. And it will send us into our world. With this amazing message of love, acceptance and forgiveness. It will convince us of the power and authority that he's given us. To bind up the brokenhearted and to set the downtrodden free. It will commission us as lovers of others. Not because some preacher came up with a strategy, but because we read the word of God and we believed what it said and we lived according to it. Can we read our Bibles? God bless you.